One of the most intriguing aspects about games for me is actually what isn't shown. Tearing into the game data and discovering random unused files, unused characters, assets, items, etc. feels like bonus content that the devs never actually wanted you to see. Fire Emblem Three Houses is an absolute treasure trove of unused content and cut, tossed away ideas that quite frankly sort of blew my mind after reading up on everything left on the cutting room floor. Thanks to TCRF.com, a website which is dedicated to documenting all of the unused and scrapped content in video games and research by individual fans like Death Chaos, we can explore just how much stuff was chosen not to be a part of the Fire Emblem Switch experience that was given to us. This video will list 15 different ideas that Intelligence Systems and Koei Tecmo had in development of this game that ultimately was left behind. Some of these, if you've been following my hacking content, might be familiar. Dedicated fans of a particular route might be familiar with some particular dialogue moments or some such, but I'm sure you will learn something really interesting in this one. Let's begin. Playable Characters like previous entries, Three Houses is no stranger towards having characters who, for one reason or another, have data as playable units despite not being recruitable. Geralt, Rhea, and Sothis fit the first description, as all three have playable data with various degrees of completion. Whether they're level up, classroom, and reclassing quotes that are fully voiced, growths, spell lists, etc., despite having non-playable roles in the story. Geralt is fairly complete for the most part, but he has no black slash dark magic on his spell list and is the only one of the three who has a complete second set of unused battle clips, which sound pretty dangerous in a sense. The Blade Breaker's Wrath. Make your peace. I see your weakness. He also has some quotes meant to be used during a tea party as well. Didn't peg me as a tea drinker, did you? Hmm, very nice. Rhea, on the other hand, is by far the most complete character of the three, and her Tea Party data was even half finished for many months until the version 1.2.0 update. She's coded to change her appearance after the time skip to her Saint Sero's clothes like in Crimson Flower's late game, though that only affects her 3D model as a playable unit. Lastly, Sothis has no personal skill, spell lists, Tea Party data, nor boons or banes, but is fully playable otherwise. She's fittingly coded to have a major crest of flames, and her class Icon is the same one added next to a save file after beating a root or playing her new game plus. Take a listen to her battle quotes. Prepare yourself! Revenge, it lives! Atone at once! I shall cut through! NPCs Near the character data where minor members of those who slither in the dark are stored, there is code for one unseen member called Cleobulus. They have a Garthen technology like all named Garthens, and are set to use Warlock class by default, and appear to use generic graphics and voice clips. While this is all the information known so far about them, it's interesting to note that, number one, their name completes the seven stages of Greece naming motif most of the important members, not named Kranya, follow, and two, that they are located between all the minor Agarthens that appear in the map Stand Strong at Shambhala, used in Silver Snow and Verdant Wind, suggesting Cleobulus was likely intended to appear there as well before being cut. There's also a trio of scrapped generics that would have managed three features cut, or altered, during development. Their names are Stable Hand, Trader, and Certification Proctor, and would have managed the features Horse Raising, in which the player could have raised and fed horses, per leftover text, Trading, which is self-explanatory, and Certifications, which would have been possible while exploring the monastery. Finally, there is one character added via DLC, which was never actually finished, to the point she even uses a placeholder portrait. While I won't go into much detail about her given I already did in another video, I will say that the fact that she has assigned voice clips that were never added does point out that she might have intended to serve an important role at one point, or at the very least be more unique. Number 3. Character Betrayals Those who have played Silver Snow, Azure Moon, and or Verdant Wind might probably know that there are some students who, in part 2, defect to the enemy side and are fought later on, and in some cases, assuming they weren't previously recruited, they can end up dead for good. Such is the case for Ash and Lawrence, whom exhibit this behavior when recruited outside of their respective houses in those routes. Not only that, in Black Eagles, Edelgard and Hubert flat out ditch the player in the second to last story mission before the time skip, and they will stay that way should you end up on the Silver Snow route. A similar case also happens with Flane, but with Chapter 12 of Crimson flower, and in both instances, they will remain as such. Besides these though, data mining the game has revealed that there were more betrayals considered. Lynette, throw down your arms. 
Would you really fight your father? I can't do it, father. I can't betray mother and my uncle. If I have to defeat you, then so be it. So, the old man's dead. Yes. I'll cut you down. Prepare yourself, you damn boar! Very well. Come at me, Felix. If you're a fan of Dimitri's Root and are invested a bit in the behind the scenes aspects of the game, you have probably read or seen videos about a scrapped situation in which Felix and Annette would have defected to the party in Azur Moon and been fought later as enemies on chapter 18. Had this made it into the final release, Annette and Felix would have used unique battle dialogue against Byleth, Dimitri, and a few members of the Blue Lions, all of which is fully voiced. While the conditions that would have led to this are, as of this video, still unknown, what is known, however, is that the game checks their recruitment status to decide whether they will replace some specific enemy units in the map or not. And it would have been not only for this battle, but also for the scene that comes before it. Are you coming, Boar Prince? To think the day has finally come when we will cross swords. Data from Claude's route reveals a similar situation was planned for Lawrence who would have defected through unknown means and be fought later in Chapter 16 like an Azur Moon and Silver Snow. In this case, he would have had just one unique battle conversation. Aren't you gonna stand aside, Lawrence? Unless we win, the Alliance can't survive. Even if that's so, to allow you past without a fight would be pure cowardice, I'm afraid. You are one stubborn guy. Later, while exploring the monastery in the next chapter, some members of the Golden Deer would have been found lamenting his death, suggesting that, unlike with Byleth and Dimitri's roots, there wouldn't have been a way to recruit Lorenz again. I've been praying to the goddess for Lorenz. We wouldn't have had to fight like that if things were different. <sighs> Poor Lorenz. He and I weren't very close, but we were friends. Lastly, by far the most interesting example of the bunch is the one within Silver Snow, as one piece of data hinting more scrapped betrayals can be still found in the game without hacking, and mostly by accident. All that matters is this. Will you return to the Empire with me? Before you answer, know that friends from our Black Eagle days have chosen to join me in the fight ahead. This line from Edelgard can only be seen if you're playing classic mode, and if any Black Eagle students besides Hubert had fallen previously before the time skip. What's interesting about it is that, not only is that it's a lie in the context of the story, as the students never come back as enemies and their endings shown at the end even tell you a different story, there actually is some stuff pointing out more Black Eagles could have switched sides in Silver Snow at one point in development suggesting Edelgard's line is in actuality a leftover of this idea. For starters, the maps shared between Verdant Wind and Silver Snow contain near-identical unit data with each other. This means that in Silver Snow, if a Black Eagle is somehow not recruited for a chapter where they would pop up as an enemy in Claude's route, they would appear in it as well. Professor, I have been thinking about why I came to Fodlin, to the Empire. I am here to be protecting Edelgard and to be stopping you. Besides this, before Byleth's army sneaks into Fort Mercius on Silver Snow's Chapter 17, a small story scene was actually coded to reflect this in such case. That man approaches. Who are you talking about? You don't mean that professor, do you? <laughs> it doesn't matter. No one could take this fortress. <sighs> Sounds like a bother. I'll be taking a nap about now. Will Death Scythe claim you? Or will I fall to that sword of yours? While the lines used by Caspar and Linhart here can also be seen in Verdant Wind, internally, both this story event and the voice clips used are located far before Verdant Wind's content, suggesting this scene was later repurposed for Claude's route. By comparison, Azur Moon gives Death Knight, Caspar, and Linhart new lines. Number 4. Items We'll start this section with none other than with Redil. The description of this two-ranged magic sword states that it was meant to be Talus's signature weapon. Up until it wasn't, it features a unique model and even uses the same particle effects as other Agarthan weapons like the Scythe of Seriel and Athame. Tomas in Chapter 8 was also meant to use a unique staff aptly named after himself, which also has a unique model. 
Given it was meant to be wielded by him and thus has unique animations, when hacked into most units, it looks kind of weird. A dark version of the Blut Gang relic also exists in the game's data. Just like the replicas used by the 10 elites in Verdant Wind, it reuses the same model of the normal weapon and is unable to trigger special combat arts. The giant birds were also considered to have a unique weapon called Sharp Wings. A Torch spell also exists, though in its current state it doesn't work if hacked into a unit. It's listed as White Magic, has an E rank, and would have been more effective depending on the unit's magic stat. Given only four maps of the game feature Fog of War, three of which are optional, it's no surprise this ended up scrapped. There's an unused seal item called the Combined Seal. That description mentions it would have allowed units to access combined classes, which is in itself a scrapped class classification type. An insane amount of baits, meats, vegetables, and other monastery exclusive items lie around wasted, either due to some features being streamlined or some, in the case of meat and veggies, being removed. There are multiple unused dishes, which not only would have been made by cooking, but also been used during battle like any other consumable item. No word if any of them can be used though. Around 20 enemy only battalions never ended up being used anywhere. Judging by the description of a few, some enemies meant to use them include, but are not limited to, members of the Western Church, flying units from those who slither in the dark, the infected villagers from Chapter 8, generic thieves, and the boss of Annette and Gilbert's paralogue. Lastly, there is one gambit in the code which was never assigned to any battalion in the game called Bag of Tricks. Its description claims it can, and I quote, set gambit counter of all allies within range to zero, though it's unknown if it actually works as intended. Number 5. Skills Given how many skills the game has, it's no surprise a few of them would have ended up unused in some way. So let's get into it. Crit plus 10 skills exist for every weapon type except for the ones used by monsters. Of these, only the white and dark magic crit skills ended up being unused. In a similar vein, a skill granting plus 20 avoid when using lances is the only one of its type that was cut, and the same could be said for white and black magic times 4 modifier skills. Also related is Fistbreaker, which is listed in the game's data to be unlocked when a B rank in bows is reached, but given this never happens for some reason, it also goes on the list. The Discipline skill, which is an exact copy of the Mastermind skill Lysithia and Yuritsa have, go unused. There are two non-functional skills that use placeholder icons and have no description whatsoever. The only clues suggesting any purpose are their names, Air of Intimidation and Path of the Conqueror. Missing Number is a dummy skill with no effects. Though the fact that it's the only skill in the game that uses a modified icon of the Wary Fighter skill previously found in Fates does raise some questions. Lastly, I want to mention two skills which, while not exactly unused, had their effects and availability limited. Paragon, like previous games in the series, is meant to multiply EXP. The problem is, though, that it's normally only seen on Hubert during Part 2, and given enemy units can't gain any EXP, you get the drill. The Heart Seeker skill in Three Houses is normally available to the player if a unit reclasses into a Dark Mage and Dark Bishop class, which is locked to male characters and even then it's built into them so you can't switch it. Despite this, the enemy Death Knight class, as in the one Yuritsa uses as an enemy, is coded to give any unit the skill when the class is mastered. Number 6. Maps Placed between the missions used after the time skip lie two unused maps, and these are a real mystery given how little data they have. The first mission loads Grandor Field as a location, and leftover text points out that it would have served as a chapter 17 in which the War of Grandor, where the three houses fight against each other in part 2 of Most Roots, take place. Meanwhile, the second map uses Fort Mercius as the location, and the remaining text not only calls it a Chapter 18, it also alludes to the same mission in which Claude and Byleth infiltrate Fort Mercius in their roots. Both maps share the same unit data, as in deployment slots, enemy positions, etc., which is present on the slot 1 reserved for maps used in Silver Snow or Crimson Flower. The units also fail to load completely in the map that uses Grandor Field due to some being placed in invalid positions, but on the map that uses Fort Mercius, they all spawn correctly. Most enemies appear to be Kingdom units, and these are the only maps that directly call for female Byleth, as a special code is used in the other missions that swaps Byleth's gender if the female option was chosen instead. Even more strangely though is that the data used in these maps is also present in the area that stores Azur Moon and Verdant Wind's war at Grandor battles, but as the data is also located in the Black Eagle slot, aka the routes which never get this chapter, it's impossible to see without hacking. As for used maps, having unused content go, there are some tidbits worth mentioning. The Black Eagles and Golden Deer versions of Chapter 7's Grandor Field 
plus Chapter 17 in Vernon Wynn's case contain data of generic replacements meant for Hilda and Dedu respectively if they're recruited, which is impossible to see normally as Hilda in Black Eagles can only be recruited during Chapter 12 of Silver Snow and Dedu is exclusive to the Blue Lions route. Finally, the most intriguing unused content one map has, which I also previously touched upon in my Edelgard documentary, is by far the deployment slots meant for Edelgard and Dimitri that are present in Stan Strong and Shambhala, the mission where the Agarthans hideout is invaded in Verdant Wind and Silver Snow, and are incidentally located at the same spot Claude uses in his own route. It's the only evidence suggesting the map could have been briefly considered for both Crimson Flower and Azur Moon early on, as no other content for the mission was written for those routes. Also, forcing the map to take place in each one as it currently is, with the same level scaling for enemies, characters, and narrative, would not work without making necessary changes fitting for each route. Number 7. Battle Quotes Besides the examples already mentioned in character betrayals, many maps in the game have fully voiced lines meant for battle that go unheard regardless. There's a handful of them overall, so I will only mention lines alluding to changes or important omissions in this video. The first mock battle between the three houses from Chapter 1 has lines from Geralt not only alluding battalions would have been introduced here, but also used the scrapped formation system shown at one point during past E3 footage. The battle will be easier if we make full use of our formations, but be wary of the foe's formations as well. Whether it's more strategic to create or disband a formation depends on the situation. Plan carefully. Also, pay heed to the enemy soldiers when you fight. Their strength can differ by the types of soldiers in their formation. Chapter 14 of Non-Crimson Flower Roots has dialogue pointing out the strategy used to trick Randall's forces into being set on fire was different at one point. The enemy units would have been lured manually into a specific spot in the map before setting the battlefield ablaze. There's a catapult on the west side. Take that and do it loudly to draw the enemy towards you. Okay, we got the catapult. Now we need to draw the enemy there. Looks like we've drawn the main army. Now we'll be ready once the fire attack is prepared. In Chapter 19 and 20 of the Silver Snow and Verdant Wind routes, Dedu was meant to have a unique death quote during the assault in the Imperial Palace. Edelgard, I must have your head. In Verdant Wind's final map, dialogue between Leone and Claude reveals the ten elites were meant to absorb damage dealt to Nemesis at one point. Not sure what's happening here, Claude, but that attack damaged a different enemy commander. His commanders must be absorbing his damage for him. That means we have to take out the commanders before we can get a hit in on Nemesis. The last specific case I'll mention is Claude's Paralogue, as there are lines which allude to Macuel being able to use lightning magic initially. Really? It wields the power of lightning? And it's difficult to move in this sand. This might not be an easy fight at all. To finish off this section in a more general note, it has been uncovered that every unit containing fighting data is more or less fully voiced in battle for any, and I mean any action they partake in. Whether it's being healed, getting involved into a combat boost, triggering triangle attacks, even if they're male, or even dying depending on the case, such as important NPCs who die in cutscenes, playable characters in Part 1 and Hubert, and Gilbert in Part 2. Everyone, ba-boom! Show them our might. Feed them to the maggots. I will assist. Need my help, don't you? Death to cowards! Artwork. Portraits. Many playable characters and NPCs have multiple portraits meant for displaying emotions they never get to use, whether it's being sad, happy, angry, blushing, or even surprised. Portraits were also added in Wave 4's DLC for generic units using the DLC special classes, though a few of them ended up never being used. Artwork. Class icons. Many playable characters have unique icons when using specific classes, mostly during Part 2, such as Hubert as a Dark Knight, Ferdinand as a Great Knight, Ash as a Bow Knight, Raphael as a War Master, Lysithia as a Gremory. Geralt has one for the commoner class that goes unused, as he's always seen as a paladin in battle. Both Dimitri and Rhea have unique icons meant for Crimson Flower that match their appearances in that route, with Dimitri having both eyes and Rhea being in her saint clothes. Icons for NPCs in the Dancer class also exist, despite not there being any generic dancers to speak of in Fodlin outside of some battalions. Lastly, icons meant for NPCs using the special classes added with Cindered Shadows also exist, though only the Valkyrie and male tricksters ended up being used. Number 10. Monastery Features and Minigames Thanks to leftover texts and assets, we have an idea of how many features KT and IS had in mind for the monastery. 
Trading, as briefly mentioned earlier, allowed the player to trade some materials and items with some locations. There is an enormous list of areas that were compatible with it, such as Bridget, Albania, Derju, Fort Mercius, Arian Road, Elmire, Sreng, Ferdiad, Morphis, Gloucester Territory, Enbar, Varley Territory, Kupala, Margrave Edmunds Territory, Dagda, Gideon Territory, Ferdiad School of Sorcery, Mayak Territory, Remire Village, and Ordelia Territory. There were plans to have seven group tasks rather than just four. The scrapped three are fishing pond management, which would have involved the students taking care of the fishing pond's water and feeding the fishes, greenhouse upkeep required that the greenhouse's plants be taken care of, and food procurement involved hunting in nearby forests to obtain meat. A mounted training feature was considered at one point. The player would have explored areas in the game while riding horses, and it would have granted them proficiency for some abilities and skills, and allowed them to participate in some sort of hunting minigame, of which there are no surviving assets besides its mention. This feature is unrelated to horse raising, mind you, which I also mentioned previously. To no one's surprise, the sauna was initially considered to be in the base game before it was reintroduced via expansion pass. Some text suggests it would have had gender-based division and it could have been explored freely. Text strings meant for arena slash tournament reveal it could have worked like other Fire Emblem entries at one point. As in, it would have required an entry fee, had selectable difficulties, had the option of choosing a specific weapon for a tournament round, and raised a student's motivation. Cooking also has unused text lying around pointing there would have been an option to preserve the meals cooked for battle and use them like a consumable item. Having a character cook alone was also an option. An online lobby of sorts is mentioned in some text, and its biggest draw would have been interacting with other players, sending gifts, and celebrating birthdays. Finally, online statistics would have shown far more stats than it currently does. Number 11 crests. Outside of the 22 crests seen during the game, there were plans to have two more that ended up being scrapped. Neither was given any graphics nor appeared to have any surviving effects, though leftover texts and flags involving them still remain. The first one goes by the name of Agarthan Crests, and its description reads as such, the Crest of Agartha. This crest is engraved into weapons created with ancient technology. It's highly likely it was going to be used by the Agarthans at some point given that Redil, Athame, and the Scythe of Sariel, weapons created by them, are coded to enhance their effects somehow when paired with this crest. The second, meanwhile, is called Crest of the Forge, and its description says, a blacksmith's crest can be attached to forged weapons. It is fittingly tagged to be compatible with every forged weapon in the game, though what boons would have provided is anyone's guess. Besides these two, every crest is coded to have a functional major and minor version, even if they're only seen in one of those two forms. This means that crests such as the minor crest of Macuel, minor crest of Ernest, and even the minor crest of Flames go unused. Number 12, Classes. Ever noticed while grinding in extra missions that sometimes there's usually one soul monster unit present that is attacked by every other enemy in the map? And how those soul monsters are the only means of obtaining some rare Arcanean weapons like the Gradivus and the Parthia and the Hot Claire? Well, it turns out that in between the monster classes, placeholder files and DLC classes, there are three classes listed that were meant for those units. If it was a wild, demonic beast, the monster would have used the King of Beasts class. If it was a giant wolf, it would have used the King of Fangs. If it was a giant bird, it would have used the King of Wings. All three classes use the same model as the normal monsters and have no assigned skills, though they did bother to give them unique descriptions despite not looking so special at first glance. Number 13. Paralogs. If unused unit and script data is anything to go by, paralogs might have worked a bit differently at one point in development. Any map including playable and unrecruited units would have made those characters actual green units controlled by the CPU, which sounds really rough for some missions in particular, rather than a playable version that can't gain the XP. Given these green units also exist for Hubert, Sylvain, Felix, and Marianne and their paralogues, it is suggested that they were also planned to be accessible regardless if the character starring it was recruited or not. Oh yeah. Did I mention all of this is applied to paralogs in part 2, which in the game are impossible to access without their required characters? I have no idea how this would have worked, but data making it possible is there. And while there is a possibility it could have been a failsafe against crashes, the fact that Petra and Bernadetta's paralog gives a non-playable Petra unique dialogue when she briefly leaves the map to bring reinforcements does put that into question. I must be going inside the stronghold and releasing our allies. Professor, friends, please have patience for the reinforcements. Reinforcements are ready. 
Take my apologies for the wait. To cap this off, Felix's paralogue contains an unused version of its script listing different victory conditions and rewards. Not only the items obtained would have changed depending on what villagers survived rather than their overall number, assuming one of them died of course, the items in question would have been a steel lance for saving most villagers rather than a Wo Dao, and the sword of Meralta instead of the Aegis shield for saving them all, which is otherwise obtainable only in Azur Moon by having Byleth talk to Rodrigue in chapter 15. Number 14, difficulty. I already covered this in a previous video, but long story short, Three Houses has a scrapped Infernal difficulty which is both unfinished and unoptimized, and gives all enemies absolutely busted stats. In the last developer interview, it was mentioned that Wave 4 would be the last chunk of DLC the game would be getting, which means a whole entire mode is on the cutting room floor. Number 15, Quests. Nearly every unused quest in the game was meant to introduce a feature which was either cut or streamlined for the final release. In Chapter 1, Cyril would have given the quest Set Group Tasks after Byleth had already chosen one of the three houses. That would have unlocked the titular group tasks. Try Your Hand at Tutoring would also have become available and been presented by your chosen house leader unlocking the option to instruct students during lectures. For Chapter 2, Try Trading was given by Ignatz and, as the name suggests, introduced the Cut Trading feature. Upon accepting it, the player obtained the item Tutorial Ore and required the item Unlock Trade to complete it. In Chapter 3, Geralt presented the quest Learn How to Handle Horses and introduced the Scrapped Horse Raising feature. A starter meat would also have been given upon accepting it. In Chapter 14, the online liaison, Traveler function, needed to be unlocked via the quest Trade Exchange Students, which is given by a generic NPC. A merchant would have also given a simple fetch quest at one point called Investment Request. Chapter 5, 6, and 7 had three library quests at one point respectively. A librarian NPC would have traded some items for books, and the later quests would have needed the previous ones to be completed to continue the chain. Repairing weapons was once locked behind a quest called One's Person Trash is Another's Treasure, which was given by the blacksmith in Chapter 6. Geralt in Chapter 8 would have needed to be given an orange item to complete the quest Nostalgic for Remire. Find the Warrior is a quest which was meant to introduce an early version of Battalions and would have been given by Sedith. Manuela at one point made you collect sheet music, requiring four sheet music items named after the four seasons to unlock the option to listen to the game's soundtrack in Manuela's room. Try certification exams was at one point given by Lysithia, and would have allowed changing classes in the monastery via unused certification proctor. Background information about students apparently wasn't available by simply looking at their character profiles. By talking to Hanuman and accepting the quest Unlock Report Cards, report cards would need to be filled to get that info. Its text also suggests that by giving the students gifts, they would have shared information about themselves rather than simply thank Byleth. To wrap this up, there are four unused variants of a quest called Free the Merchants, meant for part two of each route that would be given by Hubert in Crimson Flower, Gilbert in Azure Moon, Hilda in Verdant Wind, and Sedith in Silver Snow. To wrap things up, I've actually chosen not to mention, for the sake of time, a bunch of other content left out of Fire Emblem Three Houses, so I really encourage you to explore the TCRF Three Houses page yourself. It's really fascinating, at least to me. What is the most interesting aspect of the Cut Three Houses content for you? Horse raising, exploration, scrapped characters? Let me know down below. If you're new to the channel, or you have been watching my videos and haven't subscribed yet, I hope you can click subscribe. The channel has just reached 84,000 subscribers upon the last upload, and the next goal is 900 subscribers away from the big 85. I would like to give a big shout out to my $25 a month patrons as well. Parnholm, Melissa Farmer, Jay Brox, Artorius, and Adelaide. And especially my $40 patrons, Furmuzzle, Michael Taylor, Prime Fusion, Sleepy Sky, and Steven Rupp. And everybody else who supports me. If you want to support me through Patreon, please check out the link below. We're a small community, but we have fun. Deuces.